The Liberals Gun Corner, a proud progeny of the Gun Rights Radio Network, hosted by Cowboy T, San Francisco liberal with a gun. This podcast is always available at www.liberalsguncorner.com, and you can email us at cowboyt at liberalsguncorner.com. Cowboy T here. Welcome to episode 59. We got to talk about something. Remember, we don't pull punches here at the Liberals' gun corner, and we won't now. Nobody likes hearing that their baby is ugly. I know. I know. Many of us liberals these days, well, we do vote for Democratic Party candidates. Yeah, you can imagine where this is going. Don't worry. Don't worry. Just hear me out. Turns out our baby does have some ugliness. Yeah, and I cannot pretend that the emperor is actually wearing clothes. I can't. I just ask that you hear me out because it's important. Right now, the Democrats are trying to use their slim majority in Congress to push through more gun control. At the moment, they're trying to reenact the assault weapons ban of 1994. Well, that bad law, fortunately, expired in 2004 and it wasn't renewed. But it looks like we, as a people, voted a bunch of gun grabbers into majorities in the House and the Senate this time around. We also ended up voting gun grabbers into the White House. Oh, Cowboy T, you're just bashing the Democrats again. You sound like a Republican. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, I will call out anybody who goes after our constitutionally guaranteed rights. I've been doing that since we started the Liberals Gun Corner. And it's my job to point it out when it happens. Again, hear me out. As an American, I respect the election process. Yeah. Now, I personally would have preferred pro-gun liberals in office. Of course I would. But, well, it is what it is. Okay. And as a liberal, as a liberal, though, I got to tell you, this gun control push scares me. It really does. I know as people, most of us tend to, you know, just vote party ticket. It's maybe a human nature thing. And I also know that a lot of us liberals, we hated Donald Trump. I know the press sure hated him, and, well, it's... He wasn't exactly my favorite president either. I'm not going to pretend that he was. But voting for Joe Biden just to get Trump out? Folks, that was kind of throwing us out of the frying pan and straight into the fire. If we wanted an alternative to President Trump in 2020, we really could have done better. It's called the primary election. And there were several better choices. Um, Here's one of them. Uh, Representative uh, Tulsi Gabbard from Hawaii. I think uh, Representative Gabbard would have respected our rights as president. I don't see President Biden having any interest, though, in preserving our constitutional rights any more than President Trump did. And President Biden might even be a little bit worse. And here's what I mean. You know that old bit about, you know, civil asset forfeitures? You know, it lets the local cops just confiscate your property, Uh, ironically, at gunpoint. You know, this is if they think that there's drugs involved. Oh, and they get to share uh, in the the, the proceeds with the federales. Yeah. Uh, We call that literal highway robbery at gunpoint. Mr. Biden hasn't shown me that he'd do anything to fix that any more than Mr. Obama or Mr. Trump did when they were president. Oh, and it's just as badly... Uh, he's going on that same old failed ban assault weapons now bit that you know the code pink folks were preaching about oh nine years ago. And I'm sure they probably still are. The gun grabbers they seem to have quite a friend in the White House right now, and what's scary about that is President Biden's party, yes, the Democratic Party, for whom many of us do tend to vote. They currently have a majority in both chambers of Congress, the House and the Senate. What that means is they might actually be able to push their gun control proposals uh, proposals through, you know, and actually make them law. They're they're seriously talking about getting rid of the filibuster in the Senate. You know, the so-called nuclear option uh, to do, among other things, pass more gun control. They're actually seriously pursuing this. I'm going to explain to you why just going along with that is a really bad idea. And it is. 
We talked about this about oh, eight years ago, back in episode 11. This is back when Senator Dianne Feinstein of California, my home state, uh, reintroduced her assault weapons ban. This is back in 2013. I would encourage you to listen to that po- that episode also, episode 11, uh, because, well, Senator Feinstein has reintroduced it this year in 2021. Yeah, she's done it again. Well, just like back then, today she's got a lot of people in her political party, the Democrats, behind it. Furthermore, there's a lot of big money interests funding these Democrats, and almost all of them are anti-Second Amendment. I'm, I'm talking about you know billionaires like Michael Bloomberg of Bloomberg News. I mean, he doesn't need any further introduction. Uh, hedge fund operator George Soros, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin of Google, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, you know, the folks like that, people like that. You know, naturally, they want that return on their investment. And that return is in part, in part, and it's a big part, disarmament of the American people. Yeah, I'm serious. Now this, And there are plenty of American politicians that are all on board for this. You don't believe me? Well, here's the thinking. California Senator Dianne Feinstein worked for more than a year to get the assault weapons bill passed in the face of ferocious opposition from the National Rifle Association. She says she got the best she could. If I could have gotten 51 votes in the Senate of the United States for an outright ban, picking up every one of them, Mr. and Mrs. America, turn them all in. I would have done it. I could not do that. The votes weren't here. That was Senator Dianne Feinstein's own words. Those are her words after the passage of the 1994 assault weapons ban, the first one. But she wasn't alone. Oh, she was far from alone. She's got a whole lot of company. Uh, At the time... Then-Senator Joe Biden was also a major part of getting that very assault weapons ban of 1994 passed. He actually bragged about that on the campaign trail last year. And as President Biden, he brags about it now. And now they both want to do it again. Oh, but Cowboy T, they only want to ban the military-style weapons. (laughs) Really? That's so? You sure? Well, okay, okay, let's let's explore that. So what is military style? What just what is that? Seriously, we need to discuss just what that is. And we're gonna do just that as soon as we get back. See you in a moment. Let's uh, have a little discussion on just what the antis mean when, uh, when they say military-style weapons. I've met groups of the antis before. Gee, big surprise, I'm a San Francisco liberal with a gun and a pro-Second Amendment advocate. Usually when I do so, you know, when I meet them, I have an old Mosin Nagant slung you know, over my shoulder with the bolt open and, of course, empty. You know, safety first, right? Well, they see that old Mosin Nagant and they think it's a hunting rifle. And I tell them, well, yeah, it is pretty darn good for hunting. (laughs) Yeah, I've actually gone hunting with it. Though, of course, the deer have proven to be smarter out there than I am. Still are. (laughs) It's true. And that always gets a laugh. I tell them then that this old Mosin, by the way, isn't just a military-style rifle. Rather, it's the real McCoy. It's an 
actual military rifle. Probably saw a war against Hitler's Nazis back in the day. Then I ask him, okay, now that you know the full nature of this rifle, would you still ban it as an assault weapon? For the most part, they're not sure what to do at this point. So what is an assault weapon? What is it? What does that mean? Well, it's anything that they think, quote unquote, looks military. Well, right now they say that means an AR-15, a Tommy gun, H&K-91, and other you know, similar semi-automatic rifles. Well, there are two, at least two, major problems with this. First problem is, when you say looks military or it's military style, you got to look at the origins of firearms. Firearms were invented in the first place as, guess what, a military weapon. Yeah, that's right. Their original purpose was military in nature. It wasn't because you wanted to go duck hunting or deer hunting. Uh Uh-uh. Nope. You look at every, virtually every gun that's ever been invented. It was done for, you know, some army somewhere. Uh, Samuel Colt's first black powder revolvers, that was a military invention for the U.S. Army. The, the Remington 1858 black powder will gun, you know, same thing. It was used in the Civil War by both the Union and the Confederate sides. Now, the Confederate version had a brass, uh, a brass frame on it uh, due to the lack of steel. The Union uh, version did have a steel frame. Both sides used it. Sam Colt's most famous gun, going back to him, this would be the Colt Single Action Army. You know, the Colt Peacemaker, also known as the iconic Colt 45, the cowboy gun. Yeah, invented for the U.S. Army. Yep. Granddad's trusty Winchester? Yep, military. That old Springfield trapdoor? Military. The Mauser 98 by Paul Mauser. Yeah, the famous German Mauser 98. Well, people think of that rifle these days as a deer hunting gun, and it is. It's a very good deer hunting gun, but it was actually a military rifle. Huh. Oh, yeah, and it was highly advanced for its day. Ever heard of this little thing called the Spanish-American War? Yep. The Spanish troops were equipped with the Mauser 98 and 7mm Mauser. It was so good compared to what we had that really the only reason we won that war was because we had the numbers. Because, folks, our troops were getting slaughtered by that Mauser 98, you know, per capita. It was so good that we copied it and called it the M1903 Springfield. Uh Uh-huh. Grandpa's classic .30-06 is a copy of the Mauser 98. That thing's a military rifle and is itself a direct copy of Germany's military rifle. Grandpa's .30-06 is a copy of Germany's military rifle. But but come on, Cowboy T, we don't want to ban Grandpa's deer hunting rifle. Well, yeah, apparently they do. Remember, military style. Yes, they do want to ban it. You have a look at any modern bolt-action hunting rifle made today. Remington 700, Winchester Model 70, Savage 110, Weatherby Vanguard, uh, the, the, the Tika T3, uh, the, the Ruger M77 Hawkeye. All of them are children of Germany's military Mauser 98 rifle. You know, the one we fought against in two world wars. Also remember, the Winchester Model 70, yeah, you know, the rifleman's rifle. That was used as a sniper rifle in Vietnam. That was Gunnery Sergeant Carlos Hathcock's rifle. And that man was one of the greatest snipers this country's ever known. Today, in 2021, the U.S. Armed Forces all use the Remington 700 as their standard sniper rifle. Yeah, folks, that's right. So you see, all of them are military style. Now let's look at handguns. Classic Smith & Wesson 38 Special. I've got one. They're great. Well, guess what? They were originally called the military and police. Yeah, every police precinct in America used that handgun. When I was a kid, every cop had a Smith & Wesson 38 Special. Uh, they, they had them all the way to the 90s. Matter of fact, the, the Washington, D.C. Special Police, they still use the classic 38 Special today. The Army and the Air Force, they used it too. 
that's what it was designed for. They've been making the good old 38 special since 1899. They still make that same revolver today. Today. Oh, and then there's the, the equally classic 1911 pistol. Also designed for, guess who? The U.S. Army. Yeah. Uh-huh. John, yeah. Um, John Moses Browning. I had a brain fart for a moment there. Yeah, John Moses Browning, one of his one of his classic creations, the 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 classic 1911 pistol. You can actually buy real U.S. Army 1911 pistols from the Civilian Marksmanship Program. Did you know that? Yeah, you can do that today. And many companies have been, you know, they they produced the 1911 pistol for private sale, and they they've been doing it for decades. This has been going on for a long, long time. Smith and Wesson has made the classic 38 special for over 120 years. You can buy them right now. The 357 Magnum that General Patton carried in World War II. We can buy that, too, today. Uh-huh. It's the Smith & Wesson Registered Magnum. Patton's gun is the Smith & Wesson Registered Magnum, now known as the Model 27. Same gun. Patton carried one. And it don't get more military than General Patton, folks. You see now? When the antis say they want to ban military-style guns, by definition, they mean every last gun in existence. That's right. Every last one. Because every last one is military-style by definition. Oh, that's only the first problem. Now let's get to the second problem. The second problem here is that there actually is such a thing as an assault rifle. I didn't say assault weapon. I said assault rifle. Okay, so what's an actual assault rifle? Well, number one, it must be fully automatic, also known as a machine gun. If it ain't fully automatic, it ain't an assault rifle by definition. Number two, it must shoot an intermediate power cartridge, basically something you know somewhat less powerful than the 308 Winchester. Number three, it must be easy to carry and relatively lightweight. Number four, it must use a box magazine. That is the definition. Well, this style of rifle got started, you know, back in the Nazi Germany days, you know, when with their invention of something they called the Sturmgewehr Model 44. You see, in the German language, the word Sturmgewehr literally means storm rifle or assault rifle. That's where the term assault rifle originally comes from. You know the Swiss issue the modern version of that to every last male Swiss citizen today? Today. Oh, and every female Swiss citizen who wishes to serve. Yeah, that's right. That means they're issuing machine guns to their citizens. Because, as we all know, Switzerland doesn't have an army. It is an army. And you know they actually still call their rifles Sturmgewehren? Yeah, to this day they do that. (laughs) And they're proud of it. The message to everyone else is, we won't mess with you. So don't mess with us. But see, that's the term assault rifle, which is very specific. What about this other term, uh, assault weapon? Well... Um, I was on the Mark Levin show not uh, too long ago. It was a few days ago. And as I pointed out to him, I know, amazing, me on Mark Levin. Wow. Anyway, as I told him, it's just a negative marketing term, this assault weapon term, invented by someone named Josh Sugarman back in the 1980s. Yeah. The term assault weapon was invented by someone named Josh Sugarman back in the 1980s as a negative marketing term. This guy works for an organization called the Violence Policy Center, and his job is apparently to come up with purposefully deceiving language. I will quote him exactly. I quote, Assault weapons are increasingly being perceived by legislators, police organizations, handgun restriction advocates, this will become important later, and the press as a public health threat. As these weapons come to be associated with drug traffickers, paramilitary extremists, and survivalists, their television and movie glamour is losing its luster to a violent reality. Because of this fact, 
assault weapons are quickly becoming the leading topic of America's gun control debate and will most likely remain the leading gun control issue for the near future. Such a shift will not only damage America's gun lobby, but strengthen the handgun restriction lobby for the following reasons. It will be a new topic in what has become to the press and public an old debate. Assault weapons, just like armor-piercing bullets, machine guns, and plastic firearms, are a new topic. The weapons' menacing looks, combined with the public's confusion over fully automatic machine guns versus semi-automatic assault weapons, anything that looks like a machine gun is assumed to be a machine gun, can only increase the chance of public support for restrictions on these weapons. In addition, few people can envision a practical use for these weapons. Close quote. Folks, that came straight from the Violence Policy Center's own website. No editing, no doctoring. This is a deliberate deception on Josh Sugarman's part. He clearly does know better. He knows the difference between an assault rifle and this uh, mythical assault weapon. But he wants to actively confuse people. Well, that tells me he doesn't really have much of a case, not if you got to resort to that kind of deception. And what's more, here's the big one. It's clear from listening to this that he really views a so-called assault weapon ban as merely a stepping stone to banning handguns. Remember what he said before? Uh, let's go back to that real quick here. Where was it? Ah, yes. Such a shift will not only damage America's gun lobby, but strengthen the handgun restriction lobby, he said. His words. What's the most common sort of firearm ordinary people have these days? Yep, handguns, which he's wanted to ban for decades. The Bradys have wanted to ban handguns for decades. The Antis have all wanted to ban handguns for decades. That's their real target. Well, that figures. Because, you know, before Mr. Sugarman founded the Violence Policy Center, it turns out Josh Sugarman was the communications director for something called the National Coalition to Ban Handguns. Those of you of a certain age will remember that name. For marketing purposes, they changed their name to the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. Same organization. It's like, you know, Blackwater going to Z, going to whatever they're called now. But you can see from this that he really wants to ban handguns, the very kind of self-defense gun that most Americans have in their homes. What we're talking about, folks, is a path to total disarmament of us, the people. That's the real, true goal, the end game, if you will, of the antis. Problem. The Second Amendment is standing right in their way. So what they're really after is to repeal the Second Amendment. We see this in news publications all the time. Just do a Google search for repeal the Second Amendment. Just do that. And you'll run into editorial after editorial. And some of those uh, editorials, by the way, are posing as actual news stories, which they shouldn't be. The drumbeat is in full force, folks. Just look at President Biden's gun control plans. I will quote exactly from his own website. Quote, Regulate possession of existing assault weapons under the National Firearms Act. Currently, the National Firearms Act requires individuals possessing machine guns, silencers, and short-barreled rifles to undergo a background check and register those weapons with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the ATF. Due to these requirements, such weapons are rarely used in crimes. As president... Biden will pursue legislation to regulate possession of existing assault weapons under the National Firearms Act. Close quote. Okay, so the Biden-Harris administration wants to treat semi-automatic rifles, which, by the way, would never be issued to our troops, as machine guns. Yeah, well, he's wrong here as well. Totally wrong. The reason machine guns, etc. aren't used in crimes is because, well, when a gun is used in a crime, it's it's almost always a handgun, not an AR-15 or AK-47. No. Rifles of any sort are rarely used. 
That's because it's much, much easier to conceal a handgun than a rifle. Well, duh. <laughs> Let's keep going with Mr. Biden's gun control plans. Let's take a look at these. Quote, Buy back the assault weapons and high-capacity magazines already in our communities. Biden will, will also institute a program to buy back weapons of war currently on our streets. This will give individuals who now possess assault weapons or high-capacity magazines two options. Sell the weapons to the government or register them under the National Firearms Act. Close quote. Yep, there it is, folks. Confiscation. They like to use the little euphemism, buy back. Well, they can't buy back something that was never theirs to begin with. That's right, it was never theirs in the first place. The proper term is turn in, but they don't want to tell the truth and use those particular words, see. It's, it's kind of like when the police say they want to interview you instead of interrogate you, even though that's really what it is, an interrogation. Well, like the word interrogate, turn in, ooh, that's a mean, nasty word. It, it doesn't go over very well, so, you know, so we'll call it buyback instead. But it's a confiscation by any other name. And Vice President Harris, <laughs> well, we Californians know about her. She's been itching to do this nationally for years, and the rest of the Democratic Party is apparently in lockstep with this, unfortunately. Just like Josh Sugarman. Just like billionaire Michael Bloomberg, who's funding them. That's the gateway, folks. That's the drumbeat. Get the first step of gun confiscation in place. And that's registration. Because, as California showed us, registration ultimately leads to confiscation. Ironically, at gunpoint. <laughs> and the scary part is, here's the scary part. Here's the really, really scary part. I actually understand why they want to do that. Yeah. Even scarier. I also understand why a lot of people in this country, a lot of people who vote, are okay with it too. I actually get the thinking. Remember, San Francisco liberal here. I'm from Silicon, uh, Silicon Valley, California, folks. You know, born and raised. Went to high school and college in Seattle, Washington. You, you know, all those, uh, all those Enviro Greenies wearing the Birkenstocks. <laughs> well, I did too. Yeah, that's, it's true. I'm a West Coast boy. Up until about 13 years ago, which means for the vast majority of my life, I used to believe what they believe. So I can tell you how this happens. And I'm gonna. Right when we get back from the break. See you in a moment. We're back. We're going to discuss why these folks want to basically end private firearms ownership. I also told you that I actually understand why they want to do that and why a lot of voters on the ground are okay with it. Well, let's get into it. As I mentioned earlier, what they really want, their actual end game, is to repeal the Second Amendment and thus end private firearms ownership. Really, Cowboy T? They want to repeal the Second Amendment? Uh, aren't you going a little wingnut here? <laughs> if only it were that simple. Sadly, yes, that is the end game. Really. Without the Second Amendment in place, gun control is much easier to pass. That's why they want to get rid of it. We see this in news publications all the time. Just do an internet search for repeal the Second Amendment. Yeah, do one. You'll run into editorial after editorial. And as I mentioned previously, some of those editorials are posing as actual news stories. We even have a Supreme Court justice, you know, the late John Paul Stevens, 
Now, he called for the Second Amendment's abolition in recent times. Yeah, even a justice who swore to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States. And nearly all the news channels and publications ran with that, by the way, his, his uh, call, as a unified front. They all ran with it. The drumbeat really is in full force. And the drumbeat is basically this. One, the only people who want to have guns are domestic terrorists. Two, if you don't support banning assault weapons, well, you obviously want school children to get murdered. Three, only the police and military need guns. When you accept something at a gut level, folks, it's awfully hard to let it go. It's a near and dear belief, and we know what those are like, folks. Just consider religion. Also remember another basic human characteristic. We're a social species, we humans. We all want to be liked. We want acceptance by our peers. We don't want to get, you know, ostracized by those around us. No. You know what that's called? Peer pressure. You grew up with it in school, same as I did. You know what it is. This is what we call groupthink. Yeah, that's groupthink. No other thoughts are welcome because then you're not part of the herd, see. Therefore, you don't end up you don't end up hearing or or even wanting to hear any other views other than those of your peer group. Groupthink, folks. And there's an even more recent word for that. That word is tribalism. And that, by the way, is why this whole, you know, deplatforming and cancel culture and other kinds of censorship that we're seeing today is so damned dangerous. If all what you hear is what your tribe keeps echoing, well, then that's all you're likely to think that it is, you know, good. And everyone else that thinks something else must be bad. That's why Phil Donahue was so right back in the 1990s, you know, when he made that constitutional argument about having the right to speak. We talked about that in previous episodes. He made a First Amendment argument. Now, Phil Donahue is an avowed, proud liberal. I think a progressive liberal, and he has been for many decades. I would say he's a progressive Democrat. And, you know, even he recognized the need for the right to speak. Even he did. And even for such hateful people as Klansmen. He went to that extreme to illustrate the point of the First Amendment. Folks, if we let ourselves live in a bubble, then that's all we're going to see. Our own little group think. Give an example. My mother and stepfather, they they hate Fox News. Well, I'm not really a fan myself, i got to say. My news outlet of choice is actually C-SPAN. Yeah, Brian Lamb's creation. It kind of like Cher, you know, the famous entertainer? Yeah, she's a self-described C-SPAN junkie, too. So I guess we have that in common, Cher and I. But that doesn't mean I won't have a look at both CNN and Fox News. I'll look at other outlets that aren't C-SPAN, yeah. As biased as the Huffington Post and Breitbart News both are, I'll look at them too. It's important to do that kind of thing, folks. This is America. Why is that so important? Critical thinking. I had a mentor at the University of Washington. His name is David Prince. Well, like my dad, Dave is a very wise man. He retired about, no, oh, seven years ago. This is after decades of helping students just like me. And not just with math either. He was a math whiz, but he helped uh, lots of students with a lot of things. Perhaps his greatest contribution was something he told me. I quote him exactly. It's not who's right. It's what's right. And Dave proved to be right. There are politicians in this world that I don't care for. You've heard me talk about them. But if you, even if they happen to say something that makes sense, though, if they do, well, you know, I've got to acknowledge it. And that's true whether it be the Clintons, the Bushes, Obama, Trump. Doesn't matter. Because my mentor Dave was right. That's an aspect of critical thinking, folks. Oh, by the way, Dave is a liberal. I'm seeing a distinct lack of critical thinking in our culture today. And that's disturbing because without critical thinking, you tend to just swallow what members of your tribe say and, and, and you treat it as the gospel. 
it stops being about what's right and becomes about who's right, or more specifically, who's in my tribe. And that's not how it's supposed to work in our society. I think this is why a lot of us liberals who tend to vote for Democrats believe that the Second Amendment is just a, you know, a right-wing thing. It's because, yeah, we liberals, by and large, we, we do c- tend to kind of wonder about anyone who, you know, is not a Democrat or doesn't vote Democrat, first off. And we tend to outright distrust and dismiss anyone who's a Republican, especially a conservative Republican. Colin Powell was probably the one exception. Well, that's why so many of us tend to be Democrats and vote Democrat. Consider. Consider this. Who's putting out the anti-Second Amendment message? Fellow Democrats, by and large. Who's putting out the pro-Second Amendment message? The Republicans, by and large. Oh, sure, there are exceptions in both cases, yeah. But I'm talking, you know, by and large here. And yet, those very same Democratic politicians that so many of us voted for, they have guns to protect themselves. Yeah, that's right. We quoted Senator Feinstein earlier. Well, shortly after the passage of the assault weapons ban in 1994, which she and Joe Biden wrote, turns out the senator herself admitted that she got a gun for her own self-protection. Listen to this an anecdote about terrorism because less than 20 years ago I was the target of a terrorist group. It was the New World Liberation Front. They blew up um, power stations and put a bomb at my home when my husband was dying of cancer. And the bomb was set to detonate around 2 o'clock in the morning but it was a construction explosive that doesn't detonate when it drops below freezing. It doesn't usually freeze in San Francisco, but on this night it dropped below freezing and the bomb didn't detonate. I was very lucky, but I thought of what might have happened. Later, the same group shot out all the windows of my home, and I know the sense of helplessness that people feel. I know the urge to arm yourself, because that's what I did. I was trained in firearms. I'd walk to the hospital when my husband was sick. I carried a concealed weapon. I made the determination that if somebody was going to try to take me out, I was going to take them with me. Now, having said all of that, that was a period of time ago. And I've watched for these 20 years as terrorism has increased, both on the far extremist left and the far extremist right in this country. So, she felt the need to protect herself from harm from a terrorist group. She got a gun to protect herself. Now, while I agree 100% with that decision, I do. She has the right to defend herself from attack. We all do. Still, this from the same senator that wants to ultimately restrict my right to do the same kind of thing? Remember, if I could have gotten 51 votes in the Senate of the United States for an outright ban, picking up every one of them, Mr. and Mrs. America, turn them all in, I would have done it. I could not do that. The votes weren't here. Question. Why is it that so many of us liberals don't generally know about this? The conservatives, you know, the Republican voters, they know about it. Why not us? How come we don't? Well, it's harder to find now on YouTube, for example. Fortunately, it's still on C-SPAN, which is originally where I got it. But you've got to do some serious and lengthy searching through lots of archives to find it. Basically, what you just heard, it's going down the memory hole. Yep, that good old memory hole. And if a Republican brings it up, well, you know, then that Republican just gets, you know, dismissed as a liar and a wingnut. You know, other tribes said it must be a lie, must be a wacko. Oh, oh, it's the same in the other direction, too. Make no mistake. Uh Uh-uh. 
people who tend to vote for Republicans, they have the same view towards anyone who's not a Republican, especially a liberal. And it's outright distrust against any Democrats. Ew. Anyone pointing out that, for example, oh, racism in law enforcement is really a thing, is really a problem? Huh. The Republicans dismiss that as, oh, that's just more Democrat, socialist, anti-police propaganda lies. And that is just as wrong. It's tribalism, folks, pure and simple. Tribalism has replaced critical thinking. Yeah, yeah, us too. Unfortunately, tribalism often results in non-members of the tribe becoming second-class citizens, though. We've seen that throughout the world, not just in this country. History's proven it time and again. In the specific case of the Second Amendment, and those of us who do tend to vote Democrat, the message against the Second Amendment is a constant drumbeat. I remember hearing it myself growing up in San Francisco, and again later going to college in Seattle. Heard it all the time. My mother and stepfather, who still live in California, that's all they hear today, over and over again. Now, these are educated, intelligent people. They couldn't believe that I'd gotten into the Second Amendment. They actually got kind of, you know, scared by this. You know, they were, they were wondering if I was going to be wearing a, you know, a white sheet with the hood and raising my hand in the, the Nazi salute or something. No, I'm not exaggerating. My own mother was actually worried that I, her part black and Cherokee Indian son, was going to join the Ku Klux Klan just because I had become a firearms enthusiast. They had no interest in even hearing why, which is ironic, actually, given that my reasons for doing so involved the genocide of the American Indians. Yeah, you know, the Cherokee Trail of Tears. Yeah, that stuff. They didn't want to hear any of that, though. No, guns are a right-wing whack job thing, they said. They had no interest in the fact that black people defended themselves repeatedly from KKK attacks with their guns. They didn't care. Didn't want to hear it. To them, it was just a right-wing wacko deal. And I was apparently joining the wackos. You know, deserting the tribe. Now, Here's the especially ironic part. (laughs) These are people who helped teach me the need for critical thinking as I was growing up. And here they are totally abandoning that exact principle. Totally emotional. No reason whatsoever. They were acting like flatworms, folks, just reacting to a stimulus. All because of, you know, one of theirs basically was committing apostasy in their eyes. And they reacted like that Because that's all they heard over and over and over again. That's all they heard. It's that whole, you know, anyone who likes the Second Amendment is a bad, bad person drumbeat. You know, this sounds like something else I've seen before. Something that's really come to the forefront in recent years. Something that today we would consider unacceptable. And rightly so. I'll tell you all about it when we come back. Stick around. back. I promised to tell you what that negative reaction of my mother and stepfather reminded me of, you know, you know, when they learned that I'd become a firearms enthusiast, you know, the apostasy bit, the uh, anyone who likes the Second Amendment is a bad, bad person bit. 
Total lack of critical thinking, just an emotional, non-rational reaction. Here's what that sounds like to me. It's just like in the 1980s when a gay person first came out to their parents. Yeah. See, uh, things weren't like what they are now in 2021 today. Back then, say, if you came out as gay to your parents, oh man, that was a major case of apostasy. You were the unholiest of the holies. Your parents did everything they could to convince you how wrong this was, how wrong you were. Uh, You needed to come back to the fold, back to God, back to what's right. Yeah, both progressive parents as well as conservative parents had major conniption fits about this. Oh, yeah, I remember it. And that's just about how my mother and stepfather reacted when they found out I'd become a firearms enthusiast, too. It was very similar. That, folks, is the danger of staying in your bubble, you know, staying in your monoculture. Only listen to people who reinforce your own prejudices. And as liberals, we cannot afford to do that. I don't care if others do it. It's not how we should be doing it. My mother and stepfather eventually realized, like a lot of LGBT people who came out, that I wasn't budging either. You see, like them, I'm a pretty strong-willed person, too. You've probably guessed that by now. Mrs. BHC will quickly confirm this. (laughs) Matter of fact, she tells you that's one of the big reasons she fell in love with me, my strong-willed personality. So eventually, my mother and stepfather actually started paying attention and listening critically. (laughs) Sort of. They still don't like it. Today, they still don't like it. My mother still wants me to just, you know, shut up and not be controversial. But as she knows, or really ought to know, that ain't going to happen because that's not the son that dad and she both raised together. She ultimately understood and sort of accepted this, sort of, but it took her several years to get even to that point. And that, folks, is why this podcast exists, especially you, my fellow liberals. You especially need to know this stuff because a whole lot of you aren't hearing any of this. Rather, you're hearing the bleedings of CNN, ABC, CBS, NBC, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and all sort of all sorts of other you know anti Second Amendment outlets. I know because I hear it too. I read it too. And despite their repeated drumbeat, the Second Amendment is not a right wing thing. Nope, never was. Oh, and it's not the uh, insurrectionist thing either. No, no. And it's most definitely not a white supremacist thing. Oh, oh no. Quite the contrary, actually. It's how racial minorities defended themselves from KKK-style racists. Remember that gun restrictions and permitting schemes and registration and such, all that was to keep non-whites from exercising their Second Amendment rights. That's what it was about. We talked about that in the series The Racist Roots of Gun Control a few years back. This, by the way, is a huge reason why I'm so pro-Second Amendment. If a Charlottesville-style racist comes at me or any of my family to harm us, well, we're armed. We actually got a chance. And that's why I disagree so strongly with the gun grabbers. They want to take that chance, that chance to survive, away from me. Ironically, they want to preserve it for themselves with their armed bodyguards. And as several natural disasters have shown us, you know, Superstorm Sandy, Hurricane Katrina, and as the riots and firebombings in several cities just last year showed us, as roving gangs showed us, sometimes that best chance to survive means an AR-15 or something similar. Oh, no, no, by the way, I don't mean like how those McCloskey idiots in St. Louis, Missouri did it. No, hell no. Rather, I mean like those rooftop Koreans did during the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles. I mean like those folks who used semi-automatic rifles to defend themselves in their homes from the roving gangs in Superstorm Sandy's aftermath. 
I'm talking about the black people we saw defending themselves and their neighborhoods from rioters just last year, 2020. Even Politico talked about it. There are videos on YouTube about this. You see black people arming themselves with what the antis call assault weapons, among other firearms. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. We've seen this before. Back up, people. We've seen this before. We need to back up right now. Lots of black people arming themselves and willing to defend themselves. Yeah, we've seen that before. Now it is here where I must point out that a whole lot of those rioters, by the way, weren't black. Nope. They weren't part of Black Lives Matter. No. Rather, they were white people with Antifa. Yeah, it's true. Watch the videos. Just go to YouTube and watch the videos. But but, but wait, Cowboy T, aren't they supposed to be anti-fascist? Isn't that what their name Antifa means? Well, if that's true, then why the hell were they destroying black neighborhoods and black businesses? What the hell were they doing? And you wonder why those black folks arm themselves? Seriously? You really wonder? Think about that. Think about that for just a moment. Black people armed to defend themselves against mostly white Antifa riders. Black people possibly shooting white people in self-defense. You see it now? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Oh, but it gets better. This gets better. There are actually serious movements now in some cities for armed self-policing. They call it Black Ops, O-P-T-S, <laughs> for opportunities. The, the O-P-T-S stands for opportunities. Uh, we mentioned them in the last episode. This organization is designed specifically to protect black people against violence, and that's violence from anybody. We briefly mentioned them. Oh, uh, they're also going to be focusing on education, teaching people the trades, feeding hungry kids. Yeah, that sort of thing. Sound familiar? Yeah, thought so. Uh, Folks, that's something that white politicians and their white suburbanites have been scared to death of for a very, very long time. If black people start actually defending themselves from white people who attack them, well, what, will those darkies stop at that? Or, or, or golly gee willikers, will they think, hey, let's keep going, let's get back at whitey real good. Oh, gosh, will they think that? We've seen that fear before, haven't we? Yes, we have. It was in the 1960s when black people armed themselves, according to the law, to defend themselves from vicious attacks. I've mentioned this before. The result was the all-white California legislature quickly passing the Mulford Act, both Democrats and Republicans uniting together, and then Governor Ronald Reagan quickly signing it into law. Our blacks can't have that now. That'll show them damn darkies to oppose white rule. (laughs) And I remind you, this was in California. Not the Jim Crow South, no. But California. And it shouldn't surprise any of you that this new black ops, O-P-T-S, was indeed inspired by those 1960s black folks. Everything old really is new again, it seems. And that's because the old problems haven't gone away. Could that be what's really going on with all this gun control today in 2021? Could that be it? White people, white progressive suburbanites seeing armed black people ready to defend themselves against fellow white progressives, Antifa. I remind you that the vote to pass California's Mulford Act was nearly unanimous and hurried They hustled to push that through. 
the progressives and the conservatives of that day united together. They banded together to stop black people from defending themselves with guns from vicious attack. Could that really be the actual motivator here? Could those images last year of armed black people defending themselves in their neighborhoods really be the true motivation for this strong push for gun control? I hope not. But we have seen it before. In California, no less. And it's only gotten worse in California, probably the most progressive state in the country. Yeah. I hope I'm wrong here. I really hope that I'm wrong here. But it's looking a bit too similar now. Becomes a little more interesting when you look at the racial minorities' perspective of all this, doesn't it? Mm hmm. My fellow liberals, that's why this push for gun control is out of line, way out of line. It's not going to stop actual criminals, it'll only stop the law abiders like Otis McDonald. And it will especially stop the law abiders who are racial minorities, again, Otis McDonald, and who really need the tools of self-defense. Yeah. Remember that black mother in Detroit who used a so-called assault weapon to defend her home and her two small children from three armed home invaders? Remember that? Yeah. Well, imagine if she hadn't had that rifle. Remember now, there was more than one attacker. They broke into her home, and she was all alone. That's why her husband, a black man, bought that rifle for her to use. And she did. She won. The attackers went running, and her babies were safe. Now that's black power. And that's why this push for ban assault weapons now is so, so wrong. And that's why we need to to oppose it. We need to oppose it. You just heard why. We need to to let our representatives, our senators, and the White House know that we cannot support this. It's most incumbent on you, especially my fellow liberals, to let them know this. Let them know they'll get primaried if they try to take this away from us. Actually turn out and vote in that primary, that upcoming primary. Don't miss your primary elections, folks. Support liberal candidates who are pro-Second Amendment. You know, like Bernie Sanders used to be? Like Brian Schweitzer, a Democrat, still is? You know, folks like that. They're out there. Encourage such people to run for office, and that includes locally as well as nationally. That's your job as an American and as a liberal. And I know I'll be doing just that. The price of liberty really is eternal vigilance. Hmm. Captain Picard was right. This is Cowboy T signing off until next time. Till then, safe shooting. Practice often now that the ranges are open again. And thank you for listening. <laughs>